Hi, so in this video I'm going to be properly introducing the real business cycle model for modeling our business cycles. So in the previous couple of videos we've sort of set up the idea of what these are and how they work, but now we're actually going to look at the proper original first generation real business cycle model. So to set up this model we need a few assumptions and so we are in an economy with price taking firms and households so we have perfect competition and flexible prices so we're in a Walrasian economy or a real economy where we're only looking at real effects we don't have any nominal frictions like this we are assuming that we have inputs to production or factors of production which are capital labor and a technology term which is going to be very important to this model so our production function will utilize these three things we have that income can be used for investment or consumption so our aggregate income constraint or our national income identity is going to look something like this output is equal to consumption plus investment and we're going to assume that we have some depreciation of capital in each period and we have been denoting that with this sort of uh, symbol so let's continue and so in our model utilizing these assumptions we can now go and look at what the firms do and a firm is going to maximize its expected lifetime discounted profits and so there are there is no intertemporal trade-off when we make the assumptions we've made the objective for a firm is just equivalent to maximizing its period by period real profit. So we can just look at some period T, maximize its profits in that period, and then do the same in period T plus one, T plus two, and it just looks at periods on a period by period basis. So there's no intertemporal trade off there. It doesn't need to worry about increasing its profits in one period and that will decrease profits in a different period. It simplifies things quite a lot. So we have a profit maximization problem. I've potentially skipped a couple of steps in deriving this, but we see that we have the output of a representative firm. And as I said, we had these factors of production where ZT is our technology parameter. And then we have our capital and labor, which are weighted in this Cobb Douglas production function. And then we of course take away the costs of production in this maximization problem. So labor costs a wage rate in time T and our capital costs the uh, rental rate of capital in time T. So we do this maximization problem, maximizing profits in each period T. And if we take first order conditions in that period, then we get, we can solve quite simply to rearrange and get what our wage rate is, it is this marginal product of capital and uh, our marginal product of labor even MPL and if we solve for the rental rate of capital again we get we get the marginal product of capital is our rental rate because we're in a perfect economy it it makes sense that this is the case so this is our firm side of the model we have just changes in ZT which come from shocks and those are going to propagate to our firms but we'll get onto that later but that's our firm side of the model and our other side of the model is our households. So households have these preferences, which we can see are given by this utility function. And a household is maximizing uh, over an infinite number of future periods. And we also have some uncertainty in this model, as you can see by the fact I've included this expectations term. And it's subscripted by a zero because we're going to start in time period zero and maximize with respect to all the future periods. We're taking expectations because obviously we don't know what our income and our consumption is going to be in period one, two, three, way off into infinity. All we can do is, well, basically guess, but we, we maximize with respect to the expected value of what these will be. And we get an infinite sum and we've assumed in previous videos that we have additively separable utility functions so we can just add up the sum of all these discounted utilities and they're discounted by this discount factor beta and so we can we can expand this expression out just to get a bit more intuition about what it is so for our 
utility in period zero. We, uh, we don't need the expectations operator on this term because we know what our consumption and labor is in the current period because we are choosing it right now. So this is completely under our control. We don't need expectations. But as we move on to these other periods, we move on to period one. First, we're discounting this with factor beta because it's in the future. We have this discount factor for future periods. And we also have to take expectations. Because why do we have to take expectations? Well, we could have shocks to our economy. We could have a change in productivity. So we, we can't perfectly forecast what we're going to do in the future because our future decisions are going to be dependent on what our productivity parameter changes it to be. So we have to take an expectation given time zero information, so it's E zero of time in period one. And we have an infinite number of these and we can, we can get to period T and just generalize what this would look like in a period T. We have the discount factor beta, which is raised to the power of t because we, we discount future periods by a factor of beta. So in 10 periods, we're going to be looking at beta to the power of 10. And we're still taking expectations at time zero because we still only have period zero utility. We're maximizing at period zero. We're just taking into account period t. And so this is based on consumption and labor choices in period t. Notice that we've normalized our labor to one. So this this part of our utility function one minus LT is looking at how much labor we have and we get utility from our leisure, should I, I should have said. So one minus LT is equal to our leisure time because we can either have labor or leisure choices. And I've put this plus dot 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 because this shows that even beyond period T, we can have period T plus one, t plus 2 and that goes on until infinity we are maximizing an infinite sum it's like the permanent income hypothesis where we have these infinitely lived individuals so that's our utility function and if we want to maximize our utility function we have to maximize it with respect to a budget constraint otherwise we would just spend infinite amounts of consumption and work not at all and we'd have infinite utility and that wouldn't be a very interesting problem for us because that's not realistic so we need a budget constraint and we make this assumption for our budget constraint that we have household owning capital and they rent it to firms so this means that the households actually get this rental rate of capital they get some income from the capital that they rent out so this is a period t budget constraint which says that our expenditures can be on consumption, CT, and on investment, XT. So we can invest in capital, as we said, these households own capital, so they can invest in it through lowercase XT. And these expenditures are equal to the individual's income. So this comes from the wage multiplied by the hours worked, WT, LT, and the, in or the rental rate of capital multiplied by the amount of capital that the individuals own. So we get income from working and from our capital and we get and we can spend that on consumption or investing in more capital. And below this I have written down what the way we kind of accumulate capital as an individual. So our capital stock in period T plus one, so our capital stock in the next period is going to be equal to our capital in this period, but it depreciates. We said we have this depreciation rate, which is given by our delta term, depreciation delta, plus our investment in period T. So we, if we invest, we increase our capital stock of our individual's capital stock, and we also have capital stock that passes over from the previous period, but this depreciates at some rent at some depreciation rate delta. So we can combine these two formulas, or these two equations, should I say, by noticing that these both have xt and we're going to substitute in for xt. This is our investment term, and so I just substitute these into each other, and so we get out this budget constraint for the consumer. We prefer it in this term so that we can we can look at the investment decisions or the decisions to have the capital stock in the next period 
it's fairly equivalent to looking at just investment, but it, conventionally we're going to write it this way, which means that we have our budget constraint as we have consumption and we have the capital stock in the next period for an individual is equal to our income from wages plus uh, this term here, which is our capital stock in period T multiplied by our one plus the rents rate of capital minus depreciation. So we now have a basic model of what the real business cycle model looks like. And so we have the firm side and their problem, which is maximizing expected lifetime discounted profits. And we have the household side, which is maximizing the expected infinite additively separable utility function with respect to this budget constraint. And when we solve all of that, we're going to get out some interesting business cycle dynamics. And as you can see, uh, we can formulate a Lagrangian problem and start to solve this. So I will do that in the next video because these videos are going to get very long if I start to do all of that. So check out the future video and check out the playlist for more on the real business cycle models. Make sure to leave a like if this was at all useful and subscribe for plenty of more videos.